Oh, what is that? That is one of the other BRC uppers that they uh, submitted back for the trials. I kind of did some stuff with them on that. Obviously, a little Surefire Quiet Maker on the front. Surefire Scout Light on there, and the Tech XPS, and obviously guys they fire control parts that's kind of the way I roll it's just a my cool guy gun I dig it it's fun to shoot got my old team logo from V Squadron from uh, Elio Armory they engraved it on there for me it's just cool gun nice gun fun to shoot nice quiet it's a lot of surefire products yeah they good stuff man I mean it's it's <clears throat> I'm sure you can buy stuff that's less expensive but I've had I've had years of good performance at Surefire stuff, so I just stick with what I what I know works, and they pretty much become the standard in a lot of ways um, for for a lot of the stuff that's on this gun. So, so speaking of Surefire, uh, recently last week, Michael Voigt passed away. Um, I know he meant a lot to you, and obviously his not only him as a person, but his products play such a significant role to the United States warfighter and law enforcement. Um, you know, talk about who Mike was to you and, and what he was to your community. Wow. He's, he's, a, he's an icon. First of all, he's a good dude. He's just a good guy. I mean, I knew him personally. I, a year ago, I had, uh, had dinner at his house when I was out in California working and just hung out with him and, uh, and Maggie and just chewed the fat, caught up. I'm glad I did. Uh, he's a hell of a guy. I met him, shoot, 20 years ago. I think at Bragg, he came out and did a, a rifle rifle course for us. It was 19, 19 or 20 years ago, it was the first time I shot with him. Um, just a genuinely impressive guy. Um, the best rifle instructor I, I think that that the world's ever seen. I, I think he really was. He was just very meticulous in his descriptions. He knew exactly what he did. He knew exactly why he did it. He knew exactly how he did it. He knew what it produced. But just watching him shoot was was amazing. But he's just a humble dude. He just hung out and you know everybody that's competitive when you're when you're in the competitive mode you got to have an edge. But when he was around us, he just wanted us. He wanted us to be better, and he and he and he, and he wanted to teach us. He wanted to, to see us excel. Um, and it was just it was just it was it was a pleasure to work with him. I, I modeled a lot of my teaching style after after uh, you know after Mike, especially on the rifle side. Um, he. What he did for special operations, as far as rifle training and rifle programs go, is unprecedented. I don't think the world realizes, I don't care if the world realizes, to be honest with you, I want the American people to realize what that one man did for, for the American special operations community when it, when, it, when it comes to the ability to engage with small arms. I mean, he just was, rifles in particular, he taught us to do things that, that prior to that, Nobody did in any special operations unit. The level of accuracy that that guys like like Mike Voigt brought to the table on on uh, on the rifle side and Rod Latham brought on the pistol side. I mean, they they exponentially increased the lethality of, of those organizations. And <clears throat> the primary primary weapon system for an assaulter is a, is a is a carbine. And what we got from Mike Voigt was a logically formulated and technologically driven. He brought things to the table. He brought optics to the table when nobody was using anything but red dots. He started talking about using variable power and how you'd use them and how it extended the range of your vision, how you could engage it at longer distances. And he brought that from the three-gun world. He brought that from the competition shooting world. And people, people always push back against competition shooting. But a lot of technology that that modern special operations uses a great amount of it. And training and equipment comes from the sport world. It comes from sport shooting. I, uh, I I base a lot of the methodology for the training that I provide on things that I learned sport shooting, because sport shooting is not tactics. And that's one of the things that the 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 higher level guys that we would bring in to, to JSOC to, to train with they understood. They were not there to teach tactics. We we got that covered. We had that. Okay, we, we got it. We want to know how to shoot really straight, really fast, in any condition. And that's, that's what they brought to us. This is how you can make this tool do what you want it to do under you know, a, a modicum of pressure in training. But I, we'll, we'll teach you to, to run this 
with a, a precision that even under stress where you lose 20, 30 percent of your proficiency, you're still capable of delivering extraordinarily effective fire. And there's, there I, I know for a fact, I know for an absolute 100 percent fact, there's a lot of people that are still alive, good guys that are still alive because of what he taught. That, 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 that the footprint that he had on the community and what that translated into over the last, what, 17 years of combat? I know for a fact there's, there are guys that are still here because what he taught made them so extraordinarily effective that one or two American special operations soldiers was worth eight or ten insurgents in a fight. And, and, and it's been proven again and again where small special operations units from the, from the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, um, Air Force assets that were attached, outnumbered, surrounded, and fought their way out against every odd. Why? Because they were so efficient. They were so lethal because of the skills that they learned from guys like Mike Boyd, specifically on the rifle side. That he is the guy that really molded a lot of what we did, a lot of it. And I, I hope people understand that. I hope people know that. And and aside from from what the legacy of that, what he what he did for the for the special operations community, he did that for law enforcement. He brought that same technology to, to guys that that instead of leaving a, a Ford operating base, they leave their house. That's their Ford operating base. And they put it on and they go to work. And they keep your kids and your wife and your dad and mom safe. And he brought that same skill and technology to those guys and made them exponentially better. He was, he was one of the good guys. He, he was a, in military terms, he was a force multiplier. He made us all a lot better. He raised the bar a lot. And again, on top of all of it, he's just a good guy. He's just a funny guy to hang out with. He was a nice guy. He'd always say, if he knew you, he would always stop and say hello. I, I, I walked by him at shot, you know, shoot, every year for the last how many years? And even, even if he was busy, he would stop. And he'd stick out his hands. Hey, no, no, how's it going? Shake my hand. Hey, I'm busy. I got to gotta do the safari land thing or whatever. Like, hey, bro, do what you got to do. But he would always stop and say hello. This is a good guy. He's a good guy, and he did a lot of good for a lot of people out there that nobody knows. And his legacy in the sport world, I think, pales in comparison to what he did in special operations. What he did for us in special operations is something that down the road I hope somebody writes a book about because it, it, it saved a lot of American lives, a lot. What did the rifle program look like before Mike Voigt as opposed to after? The... I got, I, well, when I got to JSOC, it had already been, he had already been there before, and they, the, 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 the competition shooter side of it had already begun to infuse into it. But just as, as far as legacy is concerned, the, it was traditional short range speed. Um, it was more, it was more accuracy than speed driven. It wasn't the balance of speed and accuracy. It was accuracy first, and then we'll try and go faster. Not that people weren't trying to go faster. Everybody, and especially where I used to work in the Army and where I used to work in the Marine Corps, everybody wants to go faster. Everybody wants to go higher or lower or deeper or shallower or whatever the extreme is. Everybody wants to go more than anybody else. But the infrastructure to support it wasn't there and the methodologies behind it, the, the command has to support it. Hey, we want, to, we want to shoot fast, man. I mean, we want to shoot like really fast, but we want to shoot really accurate. And you, you, you've, got to, you've got to have an understanding of what that really means. And when, when you have uh, people at the highest levels that go, yeah, we want, you, we want you to learn how to shoot really fast and really accurate. So we're going to go out and find the most accurate, fastest shooting dudes out there, and we're going to bring them here. And they're going to teach you how to do that. And then we're going to take that skill and we're going to apply it combatively. That's when it all changed. So prior to that, it was just traditional marksmanship with an emphasis on speed, yes. And, and, and a good emphasis on speed. I mean, a strong emphasis on speed. But we didn't understand what fast was until we brought guys in there from, the, from that professional sport shooting side. And you, you think you're fast, and then you watch somebody like, like Mike Voigt shoot a rifle at distance. We were doing an exercise with barricades where you drop in a position, and he was showing us the, the strong side knee up technique and how you get in a position and shoot off a, shoot off a, a barricade or cover or whatever. And... He would step into position, and I, I swear, I, I remember joking about it, like his trigger was connected to his knee. When his support side knee would touch the ground, that rifle would fire. 
So as he dropped in a position, he didn't drop in a position and settle and pick up his sights. As soon as he had three points of contact on the ground, the rifle fired and he hit steel. And he was hit steel at 100 and 200 yards like it was nothing. While he was talking to us, he was talking us through it as he was doing it and doing it faster than any of us could do it. And it, it, looked, like, it looked like he was taking his time. And that's the, but his skill level was so high, that's where the bar was set. That's what he did for us. He changed our perception of fast. He changed our perception of fast and accurate, the combination of the two. And so that's, that's, the, that's where the, the real crossover point in special operations was when people at the highest levels, the, the senior enlisted and senior officers went, wait a minute, you know, if you want to learn to drive fast, you get a race car driver, okay? I don't care if you're driving military vehicles. If you want to drive fast, you get the best driver you can, race car driver, and he's going to tell you how to make that vehicle do what you want. It doesn't matter. You could take a great race car driver and you can put him in a Humvee, and he's going to teach you how to run fast, okay? And we did that. <laughs> I was on a mobility team. You know, we went to schools where we drove Humvees really fast, okay? We drove all kinds of stuff, but we went to people that raced, people that as a job went really fast, okay? They brought equipment to the edge of its capabilities and we learned from them and that's what Mike was doing. That's what Mike was doing with, with rifles. He was, he was taking rifles and getting them to do things that prior to that people didn't think you could do with a rifle or didn't think a human being could do with a rifle and he would do it and he'd be talking to you the whole time. He'd be explaining it while he was doing it. So that's, that's the, the, the legacy of, of a guy like that. Again, that whole genre of, of sports shooters that we, we began to bring in. We brought in a lot of, I mean, we brought in, you know, Rifle shooters, pistol shooters, all kinds of them. I mean, they're all every big name out there. You go on YouTube and you type in professional shooter or something, and you watch a video. Every one of those guys, more than likely, has come out to to my old place in, in, in Fort Bragg, and there's a reason. And one of the one of the main guys was Mike, and it's because what he brought was so valuable, and everybody recognized the primary primary tool we had was carbine, and he could make that thing sing. And so he was, he was teaching his best. We could barely carry a tune compared to him, but he was trying to teach us to sing, man. He, uh, he, he's just, it's, it's, a, it's a loss. He's a once in a generation or two kind of guy as far as skill and capabilities and all that. You don't, you don't produce people that can do the kind of stuff that Mike could do with everything. He shot pistols, he shot rifles, he shot shotguns, he shot, you know, three guns, sporting clays. Like the dude could, if it launched something, he could shoot it better than pretty much anybody else. And he could just pick up stuff. Precision rifle. I mean, he's just, he just, the guy could shoot anything. And that's what made him so good is he could translate it in, in, from pistol language to rifle language. I mean, he was primarily, for, for, for us, he was a rifle guy. But he could burn it down with a pistol, too. It's just he was so good with a rifle and his instruction was so good that we brought him in specifically for that. So uh, if, you did, if, you don't, if you didn't know the guy... You wouldn't know. He'd just be some dude hanging out, just some kind of laid-back dude from California. But he was, he was a generational talent, and, and you won't see another guy that's that well-rounded, a world-class shooter for I don't know, unless it's an anomaly. You won't see him for another couple generations. He just was one of those guys. So he was a friend of mine. He was genuinely a friend of mine, and uh, knew him for a long time. Um, and like I said, you could you could not see that guy for ten years, and if he saw you. He'd recognize you, he'd shake your hand, give you a hug, and be like, hey, how's it been? He's a good dude. And you know, miss him.